Hi, Discover Church. Hi, YouTubers. I'm so happy to have Pastor Arthur here. He, to us, is such a freedom fighter. Uh, he really copped a lot of injustice on the behalf of us pastors and uh, on the behalf of the church. I don't think we realize how much he did for us over in Canada. So Thank you. Uh, I really appreciate you. We support you. We prayed for you. Uh, we gave towards your legal fund. So I think that when people see people in trouble, um, it's it, probably the easiest thing is just to go and stab them and say, you know, well, the government's right if the government's against you. But I've seen it too many times where Christians prejudge too fast. Don't prejudge. Get the facts. Get it from firsthand. So this interview is to hear from Pastor Arthur firsthand. What happened to you when we saw the Canadian police just being rough with you, taking you out of the car? What happened? Why did they do that? And, and how many times did they do that to you? Well, first of all, I want to thank you so much for having me on your show. Um, hi, church. And um, my story is actually quite simple. I am an ordinary guy from a small church in a city of Calgary that probably you have never heard of. Mm -hmm. And I am a Polish immigrant. I grew up behind the Iron Curtain under the boots of the Soviets. So what I'm trying to say is I've seen this before. I grew up in hell. Yeah. Communism, socialism, fascism, any totalitarian or police state, whatever you want to call it, is hell on earth. Which Eastern European country? Poland. Poland. Uh -huh. Out of all the countries, Poland is a peculiar nation because, as you know, we were attacked by the Nazis mm -hmm. in 1939. And after the whole world was liberated and, you know, paraded on the streets enjoying the freedom over the Nazis, we were taken over by the Soviets and we were enslaved for the next three decades. So I grew up in a country that has a lot of history. I grew up in a city that had a concentration camp. I remember playing in the bunkers of the SS, learning about atrocities of the Nazis and what they have done to my countrymen. And of course, hearing the stories from my grandparents, my grandfather escaped Siberia. It took him a year to come to Poland. My grandma was arrested with my great uncle by the Soviets and he lowered her on a rope. They escaped the Soviets and came to Poland. So my family, I mean, we, the freedom is in our bones. It's our, in, it's, it's our DNA bloodstream, the fight for freedom, the fight for justice, just to be free and enjoy life. So um, what happened was graduate process in Canada of enslavement and implementation of a totalitarian regime. It didn't happen overnight. So people think that in the past three years, oh my God, what did they do? They have been doing this for a while. Totalitarian regime doesn't show up just like this. It comes and it's a death by thousand cuts. Little bit infringement here, little bit of taking your rights there, another bylaw, another law, another this, another that. And then you wake up, oh my God, this is a repetition of history because you gotta remember, Adolf Hitler was democratically elected as the chancellor of Germany by the German people. And the first victims of that psychopath were the German people, were not Poles, so were not the Jews. It was good German people that opposed the totalitarian regime. So I have been arrested 16 times, 120 court cases, some as long as three weeks, 347 citations. How much did that cost you? Millions of dollars. Actually, the Canadian government almost bankrupted me. I was a very successful businessman. Uh, we had seven houses. We had properties. Um, we had our own uh, multiple businesses. We were doing very well. And when I gave up my business and we were called to feed the poor, to take care of the, of the homeless people, um, we dedicated our lives to preach the gospel and set as many captives free as possible to save lives. And when the Canadian government attacked us, we almost lost everything, including our home. I remortgaged my house seven times to keep fighting this. And uh, when they sent me a letter that they said, we're going to take your house away because you are not paying taxes, I could not afford to pay property tax, I started to cry. I have given up everything to God. And I said, God, you're a horrible boss. You're absolutely a horrible boss. 
you're not paying me for seven years. Every year I have to retake the money from my property, from my children. I cannot afford to, to, to give them what other parents can afford. And he spoke to me. Mm. And he said, did they take your house away? And I said, not yet, but. And he stopped me again. He says, did they take your house away? No, but. And he stopped me again. Did they take your house away? I said, no. Well, I, I am not late then. Well, technically speaking, you're not. Mm -hmm. The next day, a check came and I was able to pay all my taxes. Never once God came late. Never once he abandoned us. Every single time we were in trouble, he showed up. And I think that's the message. The message of Arthur Koloski is not the arrest, is not the solitary confinement, metal cages, stripped naked and all the craziness they did to me over and over again, torture and, 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 you know, driving me upside down, all those different things they've done to me, no water, no washroom, denying my human rights and, and abusing me. The message is that my God is bigger than all of them combined together. That when you stick with God, no matter what the devil would throw at you, God will always come true, that he's faithful that he is stronger, he's more powerful. When David faced the giant, and I faced many giants in my life, i tell you what he saw. He saw an opportunity. On the other side of that mountain of a man, David saw his destiny. He was trained with the lions, he was trained with the bears. When he saw another person opposing him, he says, well, this guy is too big to miss. He understood that on the other side of that man is his destiny. He was to become a champion. He was to become a king. And he runs towards the enemy. And he strikes him with what God has given him. He struck him with a stone that was provided by God. He had a staff and a slingshot. And that's how I live. Whatever God gives me today, I use it against the giants of today. Imagine if more pastors did what, what Pastor Arthur did. In every province, in every city, pastors could have stood up. You know, during the American Revolution, the way that they won um, against the, the largest empire of the world, they didn't even have a standing army. The pastors would hear the British were coming. They would pray and say, whoever is willing, let's go out and fight for our family. If pastors knew that was part of our call, you know, we're to stand up for our family, we're to stand up for our nation, then we wouldn't have all these very underqualified, basically idiotic, bribed people ruling over us. Yeah. They tried to bribe you, right? Are you able to uh, reveal? Because I've always said this, by the way, I believe no, nobody, they, when they start out, they don't even know they're going to be evil. I don't even think the Antichrist knows he's the Antichrist. They start out with good intention. They get elected, they get power, and power corrupts so fast, and they get offered something. I believe Satan makes an offer because you Always. see that he, he offers Jesus Always. these things that Jesus would have liked. So he has to make an offer to, to shut people up. You know for firsthand that happened. Always. Known are to us the tactics of the enemy, the Bible says. What there was, it will be again. The devil, and it drives me mad when I see sometimes on Facebook or other social pat platforms the picture of Jesus wrestling with Satan. Listen, Satan is just a creation. He's not the creator. There is no wrestling. God is not wrestling with the evil. He can finish evil like this. He allows evil to exist. He holds our enemies in the palm of his hands for a purpose. Everyone has a purpose, including evil people, for a purpose that sometimes we do not understand. And bribery, coercion, blackmail is always a part of the enemy tactics. When devil, when Satan showed up to tempt Jesus, what did he say? What he offered him? I give you all the kingdoms. I give you this and I will give you that. Just bow. It's so easy, right? Just bow and I will give you all of that stuff. But you got to remember, Satan is a creation that wants to become a creator. He wants to be worshipped like our Lord. We cannot give Satan that. So they offered me $2 million. 
to stop talking. And it's so fascinating. Every time they would come with bribery, blackmail, coercion, threats, whatever, it was always to do with me talking. Is that not fascinating? Because what the Bible says, there is power in a time, life in your mouth, death. So I was offered $2 million. I was offered a guaranteed seat at the government. I could be a government right let, now. Let me just, let me just say what, that, what, what we just heard. Pastor Arthur was guaranteed a seat in the Canadian government. I believe people are being selected and not elected. And this is happening in Australia. It's people are underqualified. Like how did a guy like Dan Andrews become the ruler of a great state like Victoria? So incompetent has botched everything that, that he touched and now resigned. Somebody came and offered him. But yeah. this is the thing is, even the atheists who are listening, you want people who stand on principle to be ruling over the nation. And the only people I know that stand on principle are some Christians, not even all Christians do that. But if you're guided by your fear of God that he's watching you every single second, then you're not going to say, well, you know, wow. Well, I'm going to sell my soul and my integrity and my life and my calling for two million. Two million is, is what? Two houses these days. They think they can buy us with two million. I, I, I'll tell you, I was asked, why didn't you take it? Well, even if they offered me a billion dollars, it's just a number. You see, I'm not for sale. Pastor Art Pulaski is not for sale. I'll tell you why. Because I've had, I have been already bought by the precious blood of Jesus. We are I cannot sell something that I do not own. The moment I said yes to Jesus, yeah. my life belongs to him. I love this. So the devil got it from Jesus because Jesus came to us first and said, I make you an offer. I'm going to trade my life for yours. I'm going to trade my seat in heaven with you and you can come and sit, ne sit next to the Father and you can have heaven as your home. So do you take the offer? And, and in exchange, you must bow to me. Yes. You so, must bow to Jesus. It's all about uh, it, it's all about bowing. You see, Satan is a copycat. He wants what God rightfully has. I remember the conversations. It was, it, it was about 10 times, including the premier calling me and making deals and all kinds of different things. Call, uh, they call themselves political fixers. Fixers are the people behind the politicians that are doing deals where the politicians don't want to be seen or recorded. I had fixers calling me. Um, I had politicians coming to me offering a medal. They offered me a medal if I just shut my mouth. Well, I remember Obama giving medals to people like Oprah Winfrey. And like, how is that? What, right? For what? For, For what? being evil. And then Obama got the medal of the Nobel Peace Prize, and he hadn't done anything yet at his his presidency would be marked by total bloodshed and increase of war and, and destruction of peace. That's right. And yet they gave the medal. So these people really, they, they had to answer to an offer for money, status, medals, and they took it because they were not grounded in, their, in a faith in God and in the fact that we're, we either obey God or we're going to suffer the punishment of being rebels against the Creator. We don't want to be rebels against the Creator. We'd rather be rebels. They're going to call us rebels. Rebels and criminals for speaking. That's all you did. Did you hurt anyone? You know, a true story. During the Polish Revolution under the Soviets, the Soviets were calling us criminals for simply standing for our God and state giver rights. During the Nazi, they called us bandits for standing up against the Nazi regime. Nothing is new under the sun. They will call us names. They will try to vilify us. They, their house of cards is built by lie, manipulation, misinformation, disinformation, lie, more lies, piles of lies. But truth is like a pillar. It stands on its own. It doesn't need any support. When I speak, I speak from my heart. I don't have to think about anything. That's the story. That's the truth. You ask me at 10 years from now, that's the story. That's the truth. I don't have to remember what I said 10 years ago, 20 years ago. That's why my preaching is always the same because the Bible is the same. The same yesterday, today, and for me. I have a for question for you. What about this? Because we know in Australia, we know the fixers in Australia. We've even seen some of them. Um, they can't buy us. But what about pastors? Do you think that there are influential pastors 
who have been approached and have been offered a satanic gift, a satanic offer. Hadar Hussain. You don't know, know for sure? I know for sure, and I know I can give you names, uh, um, and it's, it's a lot of money. Canadian pastors were offered millions of dollars, just like I was offered millions of dollars to sell Jesus for silver, and they did it. They're selling Jesus for silver. That's They're it. They're saying, I'm going to take a couple of million, and that's, that's I, and I trade Jesus, the real Jesus. I'm going to give you the real Jesus, and I get to keep these silver coins. But they don't think that way. You see, they have bought a lie. In the Bible, it says that there will come a time that where God is going to give them into a heavy delusion. When you said, my wife has this great way of looking at things, and she said, when you open a door to one little sin, through that opening, more demons will come, more sins. So it starts small. The one compromise at the time, right? Well, I'm going to close one eye, and then you're closing two eyes, and you don't see anything, and then you're closing your ears, and he's like, do not see, do not hear, I won't say anything. So they were offered millions of dollars uh, for shutting down the church, segregating people. Oh, you mean the ones preaching, saying, go with the COVID thing, and you know, we are used to, we can't say too much, but shut down the church. That was incentivized. Yes, millions, millions. Billions of dollars were given to the Canadian so church. So church, you have to understand that because I'm very pro-church. I love the church. I love even the mega churches. But just, you have to be pure. If you preach against the Bible, Jesus didn't say, go ye into all the world and jam everybody. Yeah. There's, there's no way. So if you're standing up there, there and say, if Jesus were alive today, Jesus would go down and get the jab. And that is, there's cool. more. Canadian churches did a lot of wars. Yeah, what you're saying, if that was not bad enough, you know what they did? They hired security guards standing outside of the doors, preventing people to come in. And if they, ha if they didn't have the Nazi passport, I call it a Nazi passport. Um, Canadian churches, um, some of the biggest churches that I know personally, they turned their facilities. So they were told by the government to shut down because of, of pandemic. And then they turned their facility to a COVID clinic. Yeah. Jobbing people, yeah. churches, yeah. pastors from the pulpit were saying Jesus would do this, Jesus would receive it, be a good neighbor, do not murder your grandma, do the right thing, obey the government. You know how much I was harassed by those people uh, with a quote from Romans 13? And I said, Romans 13, that, I got that quote too when I spoke to The whole chapter. Yeah. What is the government's job? The government's job Perfect. is to punish evildoers. Right. Not those that do good. Those that do good are supposed to be protected right. by the government. Right. They, everything is upside down. The Bible says there will come a time when they will call what? Good evil and evil good. Uh, my friends, we are living in such a time. And, I, I, you know, I am sometimes ashamed to call myself uh, by the title that those people call themselves with because they have failed, not just Jesus, they sold their faith, they sold their congregants to the wolves. Mm. They were called to protect the sheep How did you with their out? whole body against the wolves. And what they did, they were hired guns and they threw the sheep into the mouths of the wolves. Yeah, the wolves ate the sheep. You know, so for me, I'm very unapologetic about this. Whenever you sow into Pastor Arthur's ministry, my ministry, I can tell you 100%, we never took a single dime or penny from these globalists. Yeah. We didn't take bribery. We didn't change our message. But sometimes the Christians, they don't understand. If you don't take it, that means that Galatians 6 verse 6 says, the Christian have an obligation when they're listening to teaching that's feeding your soul. It's like paying for your own food. We're not trying to hurt you. We're trying to continue the ministry and God is going to take care of you and bless you. But this is the economy that we're living in. Instead, because Christians don't preach this stuff, and these big churches then don't have the tithe and offering, they don't preach anything that offends you, because they're getting all this kickback and all these promises from sa Satanists, are Satan. they? They're Satanists. You know how many people I feed? Thousands. You feed thousands. I've met, I, I fed millions of human beings. I started over 40 churches that feed tens of millions of people. Yeah. You know how many times I run out of food? Never. Mm. It never happened. 
never ha going, going to happen because my God is the God. He is a faithful God. He says in his word, feed the poor. Yeah. I go and feed the poor. Maybe you're reading a different Bible and if you're reading a different Bible than I get it, why you don't obey the word of God. But I read the Bible many times, believe it or not. And most of the pastors have never read the Bible. In my Bible, it says, do not forsake the gatherings of the saints. Right. Full stop for me. In my Bible, it says, remember me, remember the blood, remember the cross. That's why we have Lord's Supper, the Holy Communion. And I have it every week. Why? Because I want to remember and I want the people to remember why we gather. We gather because of him, not because of you. Once he said to me, it starts with him and ends with him. And there's a lot of dust between that's you and me. It's all about Jesus. You're not the center of the universe. He is the center. Jesus Christ is the center of the universe. In the Bible, it says that he who lives in the worship of his people, Canadian government forbidden us by law right. to worship. First time since Jesus died on the cross that globally and people they, didn't celebrate they, the Passover. And they did it. The Canadian government said, you're not allowed to worship your God. And the pastor said, well, sorry, we cannot worship. Are you kidding me? You know what I did when the Canadian government canceled Christmas? You know, Canadian government canceled Christmas. They said you're not allowed to have supper, uh, coffee. Uh, we're canceling Christmas, no dinners. You know what I did? The first thing I did, I invited my parents, my whole family and friends for a dinner. And I took a picture and I sent it to them. Come and get me. When the Canadian government came and said we're canceling Christmas celebration, you know what I did? I invited people to the biggest Christmas celebration in the country. Thousands of people showed up and I had hundred police officers, 20 cops on bicycles, anti-terrorists, chief of police, special force. And I did something that Kenya government said, if I do it, people are going to die. The whole neighborhood. Oh yeah, they said, that you're, you don't love your neighbor. You're going to infect your neighbor. I fed the poor. Yeah. We had AAA stakes. I gave hundreds of gifts away to the homeless people and I hired carolers and we were singing praises to the living God. And the police showed up and they gave me 15 tickets for just that one event. And you know what? I was blessed beyond measure that God found a little pastor in a little city worthy to be punished for doing what the Bible was to be punished. And yeah, I did it bloody. I was asked so many times by crown prosecutors, by judges, by media, and I said to them, I gladly did it, and I will gladly do it again. I'm not sorry. I'm super proud that I was with the truckers. Okay. I am uh, proud that I stood with the hurting people. And if I had an opportunity to do it again, I would probably do it more, not less. Christians are being persecuted like never before in countries like India. Women are raped and children hunted down with machetes and guns. Discover Church is involved in feeding Christians who are fleeing for their lives and whose churches and homes have been burnt down. Please consider supporting Discover Church and being part of protecting persecuted Christians and rebuilding their lives. The cost of feeding a person in East India for one month is just $10. Would you pledge $10 for one Christian? Or $100 for 10? Or even $1,000 for a tribe of 100 believers to survive? Our ministry will deliver international aid to people forgotten by governments and NGOs. Partner with us in this vital ministry and give now at discoverchurch.online forward slash give. That's discoverchurch.online forward slash give. Please give now. This is the thing with the truckers that I saw them acting more Christ-like, more biblically, yeah. having more courage than the Christian pastors. I don't understand that because we pastors have nothing left. We've given everything up, right? To be a pastor is just to serve God, serve people. We're not, we're not inventing. We're not selling iPhones. We're not, I don't know. We're here to serve. We're here to help people, protect them, care for them. And the truckers are out there very peacefully saying, we don't agree with Justin Trudeau. In a democracy, you're allowed to not... You're allowed to disagree. You don't have to agree, right? And yet... They're real democracy. And yet, it's strange, huh? Um, the people villainize them. The people would rather obey government unconditionally than obey their pastor or the, their God 
unconditional way. I don't understand that. It, yeah. It's easier to obey God unconditionally. Why would you obey these these unqualified, corrupt people? Because they have been sinning for so long that they don't even know they're sinning. Callous. God has given them into a heavy delusion. delusion. You're telling, you know, here it is. And I witnessed it hundreds of times, if not thousands of times. This is a cell phone. And they say, no, it's a horse. No, sir. This is a cell phone. No, it's a horse. And they will fight you to the dead because they've lost ability yeah. to understand, to see. They have eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. They have been given into a heavy delusion because they refuse to repent from their sin. They are like Judas Iscariot. He was never changed. He was a crook, a thief from the very beginning. And when it was time to betray Jesus, he gladly did it for an incentive. But the sin started not in the Last Supper. The sin was there for years from the very beginning. And that's the problem with the Canadian church. They have not crucified themselves. They think that this whole thing is some kind of a joke. It's a game. They think that Christianity should be fast for uh, no fast food, quick Christianity. And I say to the people, it cost the father. It cost the father. Listen to me. It cost the father the life of his own son. And it cost the son his own blood. He paid it with his own life. Do you really think it's not going to cost you anything? Do you really think that it will not cost you anything while it cost God everything to save you? I don't get it. Um, They've sold their souls for a, a bowl of soup like Esau, no. or they sold Jesus for a silver coin like most of the people. You see, I can, I can live with Peters. I've met many Peters. Peters were scared. I can live with that. I can understand fear because I understand fear because I grew up in hell. Right. I know how powerful those people are and how scary things are when, when a gun is to your head. I can live with Peter. There is hope for Peters. Peters can come back. God can restore. God can restore Peters. But there is no hope for Isis. And there is no hope for Judas Iscariot. Because they willfully, they willfully, not because of fear, because of greed, selfishness, they sold their inheritance for an incentive, mm. for a bowl of soup and a silver coin. Those people are going to perish and they will pay severely. Why? Because when you are a leader, you have a double, you will be judged double. There is a double responsibility. So I, 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 I was told by God some time ago, he said there is a special place for pastors that sold them. Who sold him? Sold him. Because, you know, when you're an atheist, I, I prefer, and no offense to you, you're a pastor, I prefer to spend time with the drug addicts, prostitutes, drunkards, and that's what I do. That's my ministry. It's called Street Church, streetchurch.ca. I take a team to the streets. We feed thousands of people. I preach the gospel. We have worship. We have a church for the poor three times a week. And um, you know why I appreciate them more? Because they're real. They know they're sinners. They know their lives are messed up. I can't stand hypocrisy. I can't stand Pharisees and Sadducees but because they pretend mm. that they're better. They pretend that they're holy, but they are evil. They are sold out. They are Judas Iscariot pretending. There's nothing worse than a wolf in sheep clothing because those people tear others apart. They themselves do not enter and they prevent others from entering. I was going to mention, you know, if we talk about Christmas and you are standing up for Christmas and feeding out other people, all I hear is life, life, life. But all these religious nuts, you know what they'll focus on? What day was Jesus really born? Oh, it's not really Christmas. And they go into a stupid war, right? That's that's irrelevant. And I can prove it theologically too, but I'm not going to do it now. No, I, I, I and I agree with you. I know he was not born that day. But you know why I do it? Because it's an opportunity. Right. God, Jesus was an opportunist. He, he never missed an opportunity. Right. I did have to share for a day with a, with a Samaritan woman. He dedicated his entire day to talk to a woman, woman that no one else would talk to. Mm. And then we know that the revival broke in a village. And then we know that mm. Apostle mm. Philip 
and had a revival in the entire Samaria. We cannot miss opportunities. When I see the festivals, and even though I know mm. they are miscalculated on, or wrong, mm. but it's an opportunity to talk, to talk about Jesus. It's an opportunity to be the hands and the feet and the mouth of God himself for that moment because the hearts of many are open during that time. So I use any opportunity. Give me a festival and I will do it. Be the poor, preach the gospel, tell them there is one way, and that's Jesus. Outside of Jesus, there is no salvation. Yeah. I think one thing that Christians can take away from this interview is you need to think about when you open your mouth and you want to tear down someone and criticize someone. First, did you, did you do Matthew 18, which is you privately go and approach someone. I've had so many pastors too, and I love pastors, but so many pastors prejudge and they hear rumor, they hear this and that, and they never talk to me. I think my phone number is right there. I will not criticize. I will not get myself in trouble and I will not tear down any other person or ministry because they serve God. But the second thing that I want to say is before, even if you knew for sure that somebody uh, was in the wrong somehow, they don't live up to your standard, they celebrate Christmas on the wrong day or Jesus' birthday on the wrong day, but are you sure that you're actually bearing more kingdom fruit than that person that you're criticizing? We really need, need to judge ourselves. Like all the time I wake up and I think, have I, have I told enough people about Jesus? Have I helped enough people? Have I done enough? Like you said, you and I, like when we go on holiday, we still got to do something, you know, we got I, I, to share the gospel. So it's I've reached a guy crazy. Yeah. So we, our wives are very supportive of us and have, have accepted this uh, life of ministry. But it's fun. God, God is good to us. It's God the best is adventure you can imagine. I mean, people, you know what is weird? People come to me, and I don't want you to get this in the wrong way. They come to me and they say, poor you. Like, no, you don't get it. In my Bible, maybe reading a different Bible, it says, great is your reward. You know when God says great, you know what that means? That means great. Wow. Great, great is so your reward when all those different things happen to you, when people persecute you, attack you call your names and all kinds of different things, arrest you, you know, you, you know, uh, torture you and then strip you naked for, for, for his kingdom's sake. Great is your reward. I'm looking forward to the kingdom of God on the other side of eternity. I'm looking forward to spending time with the heroes of all. You know, when you die and you will die, it's just a matter of time. You're going to be sitting with Apostle Peter or Apostle Paul or John or other heroes from the old, what kind of a stories you're going to be sharing with them? I was faithfully pew warming for 50 years. I never missed a tide. Listen, they have stories. They have exploits. They have adventures. I can talk for weeks about the things that I witnessed, the miracles. And you know, <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. The story of Art is is ever a simple one. They've done everything in their power to destroy me, only for God to elevate me. You see, my God is bigger than all the giants of the land. My God is bigger than all the mountains that you can see. My God is bigger than their guns, their, 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 their planes, their tongues. My God is bigger than the judges. He is the judge of he judges. The judge. And the story is very simple. Remember, fear not, because he is with us. The greater is he that is in me than the one that is in them. And the story is very simple. God is bigger than the evildoers. Just be faithful, and he will take you through the valley to the next mountaintop for the most amazing views. This is like a roller coaster, which is exciting. It's adventurous. You go so fast, you know, but it's awesome. I wouldn't change my adventurous life for any money or any other position. Never. I was offered different things. I was offered a guaranteed seat at the legislature. I was offered a, a government job. I was offered money. I was offered church. I was offered houses. No, I'm not for sale. Jesus already has me. He already bought me with his precious blood. How much is the blood of Jesus worth? A billion? Ten billion? A whole world? It's priceless. And so... 347 citations, 120 court cases, 16 arrests, and uh, a coercion, a blackmail, a bribery, trying to burn my house in the middle of the night, tried to burn my church, tried to murder me multiple times, and here I am sitting in front of you, and you don't see me depressed, you don't see me suicidal. I mean, 
Well, thank you. Jesus, they, Jesus they, my life. They give you counseling already, give you some psycho psychiatric <laughs> drugs, and you know the I, answer to your emotions is not more drugs. Is you gotta obey God. I Christ counsel counselors, by the way. They're so depressed. They're, they are so depressed. <laughs> I think they get into so it because they got some emotional psychological problem. They're trying to understand themselves. But you know, we're not to be afraid. Remember this, huh? That's Don't right. be afraid. God, God is so much bigger. It's such a simple thing. God is bigger. But when you're going through something. You don't realize he's going to turn it for your glory. Your pain will become a platform for Jesus to shine his light through your life. But like you said, everybody is going to pay the price of some pain. Because it touches me every single time. God revealed it to me that we make a fundamental mistake. Instead of running towards the fire, we have a tendency as humans to run away from the fire. There were three men in a high position, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were told very clearly, just like we were told very clearly, bow. Yeah. Bow before the golden muzzle. Mm -hmm. Bow before the job. Whatever it is, bow. When you hear the sound, I want you to bow. And if you don't, you're going to pay. <laughs> and they said clearly, no, we will not bow. And the, the, the king, the Nebuchadnezzar, gives them a second choice. And he says, now I'm going to give you another choice to do the right thing. Bow. Take the job or sell your friends. And they said, no. And he says, who will take you away from my hands? I love that because he challenged God. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, great king, either God saves us or not. No, this will not bow. Off they go to the fire. But you see, he was in the fire mm -hmm. that God dealt with their enemies. It was in the fire that he showed up to set them free. They were bound in the fire. And Jesus personally shows up to set them free. How many of you would like to have a personal encounter with the living God? Pretty much everyone, right? You got to go to the fire. He always shows up in a fire. He showed up in my cell. He showed up in a metal cages. He showed up when I was naked. He showed up when I was on the concrete. He showed up when I was shackled like an animal and taken to the most dangerous prison in the country. He showed up when they put me in a psych ward to try to break me. So I signed the paper of a plea deal that I'm guilty. Jesus shows up in a fire, but it was in the fire that they had the greatest testimony for the whole world to see. And it was in the fire that was their promotion. How many of you want to be promoted? Nebuchadnezzar looks at this and says, this is a miracle that no man can do. Come out of it. And he says, anyone that speaks against the God of Shadrach, Michigan, and Abednego will be chopped to pieces. Nebuchadnezzar, the bloodiest king of that time, became the greatest evangelist of all times. How cool is that we miss the boat as a global church. Don't do that again. God is giving us a second chance. Listen to me. I'm prophesying right now. Some of you will have a second chance. God wants you to have a second chance. God is speaking to Peter. Come out. Be courageous. I'll restore you. I'll give you back what the enemy has stolen. Come to me again and be courageous and be willing to die. And I will give you a Holy Spirit. And your, your end is going to be glorious. He's giving you a second chance. Don't sell him again for a bowl of soup, silver coin, or because of fear. Mm -hmm. Do not do it. Be willing to go all the way. When you are willing to go all the way like the three men in the fire, you'll have the greatest testimony ever for all the, the whole world to see. And God is going to promote you either on this side of eternity or on the other side of eternity. It doesn't matter where he's going to show up for you to give you what's rightfully yours, which is inheritance mm. at strong that you will sit with Jesus. How cool is that? The best, the best. You know, ultimately as a Christian, we have to be willing to die. So that means once you take care of that, you're willing to evangelize, you're willing to give your assets, you're willing to uh, serve, you're willing to help others, but you gotta be willing to die first. But, but you know, I hear young men telling me I'm willing to die. And I say, no, you're not. Yes, I am willing to die. No, because you're not willing to live for Jesus. If you're not willing to live for Jesus, if you're not willing to testify for Jesus, if you're not willing to be ridiculed for Jesus, if you're not willing to be slapped for Jesus, you're not going to be ready to die for Jesus. So you're going to conquer every little fear. So, someone asked me, how come you're so courageous? <laughs> it's one step at the time. Is one decision at the time is don't compromise here, don't compromise there. It is like it's like building a faith muscle. It's every day. 
you go out there and you face your giants. Sometimes there are very small giants, but you got to face them and they grow. And God is going to give you greater and greater authority until you face a giant that you cannot even see the end. But you have the strength and you have the passion and you have the truth and you have the faith to take down any mountain that is in front of you. It takes steps, one step at a time, one action of faithfulness at a time. Be faithful with little and God is going to, to give you more. That's the story. That's how you take down the giants. And I just want to close in mentioning that uh, we have something in common. I did live in Canada for a couple of years and I lived a very godless life. And I feel like I got to pay back Canada with the gospel. You know, I had to come back and preach the word of God. Welcome. Are they, are they, what do you think? Are they going to persecute me and uh, stone me for coming over? They, you heard me preach just now. So do you think they're going to receive? You know, um, if there will be stoning, I'll be the first one. Okay. So don't worry. I am, um, when I preach, there is zero compromise because I don't understand compromise. For me, it's either life or death, either left or right. Choose ye this day whom you're going to serve. You will be perfectly fine. You will fit right in within our church and I will do my best to get you into other churches, friendly churches that are not walk. I've seen a lot of woke churches. I'm really surprised how they came up. Where did they come? In you Canada, think? you got uh, uh, homosexual flags pretty much everywhere. Uh, you've got uh, pastors embracing transgenderism, abortion. It, it's, it's crazy. It's absolutely yeah. sickening. However, there are still good churches and there are still good pastors. There is a remnant on the rise. Once he said to me, I will bypass the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the so-called leaders. I will bypass them and I will give a revival to faceless, nameless nobodies. That's how he calls us, hmm. in the eyes of men. But they are somebodies in the eyes of God. You are a somebody in the eyes of God, even if the whole world goes crazy. Once he said to me, remember this until the day you die. You and me, we are always the majority. The whole world can go crazy. I don't care. That's up to them and God. I will stay faithful. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb. Worthy is the lamb. Grace. Amen. Amen. Well, this has been a real honor. God has had to bypass other people so that we can get, get together today. I believe it's a real divine word. And that's going to wake up and help a lot of people. You're getting a second chance. There's going to be some other lockdown, some other war. You're getting a second chance. Do it differently. Don't just jump in and repeat nonsense. Repeat the word of life. Repeat the word of God. Keep obeying him when it seems difficult, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It's a really good word. I was very encouraged. Thank you, Thank Pastor. You so much. God bless. God bless. And you're welcome. On camera, you're welcome yeah. to come to Canada, and I'll do my best to put you in other places. So your message is very needed and very important. Sometimes people, the easily, the more easier will take a message from an outsider than from a person that lives among them. That's why we travel. That's why we do mission trips because sometimes it's easier for them to receive the word from someone that is not so threatening to them. Yeah, that's why you need it. Thank you for that. You're all needed. Listen to that. You're all needed in this time. God bless you. God bless you.